Um, Looks like there's some still some people entering in, but it has slowed down considerable considerably. Mm -hmm. um, so hi everybody, happy March. Uh, winter has arrived in full force here this month, and I hope that you've had a chance to get out and enjoy it. Uh, for those of you tuning in for the first time, I am Abby, the executive director of the Vermontsky and Snowbird Museum. This has been our sixth season of the Red Bench Speaker Series. I'm pretty sure it's the sixth. Uh, thank you for continuing to tune in. As you know, these virtual events are complimentary, but we still need your support. We are a nonprofit organization and your donations are what help us move forward. So if you haven't already done so, please consider making a donation tonight. All donations, as always, in increments of $10 will be entered into a raffle for a pair of darn tough snow socks and I'll draw two winners tomorrow. Uh, and Red Bench season pass holders are already entered into that. Uh, and it feels like just yesterday, back in September, that we were gathered in the museum listening to Hilary Girardi share her Houtroot experience at the launch of this season. So it's really crazy to announce that this will be our last Red Bench event of this season. Um, I want to give a massive thank you to our Red Bench series sponsors, Silver Sponsor Scholar Textile, Bronze Sponsors AJ Ski and Sports, RK Miles, Sisler Builders, and our media sponsor Vermont Ski and Ride. They make this possible and we are so grateful. Um, we're really excited about tonight's discussion. For those of you with HBO or friends with HBO, you may have already seen Dear Rider. I highly recommend watching it, but after tonight, my recommendation will be mean nothing. Your interest will be fully peaked. Uh, <laughs> moderating tonight and joining us again is Chris Copley. Chris is a 20 year Burton veteran as the pro team manager and US Open announcer at Stratton. He's put together a thoughtful discussion for a behind the scenes look at the making of Deer Rider. Joining Chris on the red bench is film director Fernando Vienna and co-producers Ben Bryan and Mike Cox. Their backgrounds are impressive and I'm sure you're all antsy to meet them and stop listening to me. Uh, as always, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. So please type those into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And Chris, I'm gonna now hand this over to you to make the proper introductions and get this conversation started. Thanks so much, Abby. Uh, I know putting these things on is, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, I, you know, at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum, if you haven't ever seen this, if you come to Vermont in the summer or in the, the winter, in the summer, this museum is super cool. So you, you just got to check it out. We just did, uh, there's a big exhibition of Scott Lenhart's art. He did a lot of graphics for Burton Snowboards and that exhibition is up all the way till October. And you can also check that Red Bench series uh, talk out. And then we did another one that was really cool on the photographer Gary Land. And he wrote this book called East Street Archives that captured like the 90s snowboarding. It's this big, thick book. It's insane. Um, so the, like the Vronsky and Snowboard Museum is, has some really great stuff. They have some 10th Mountain Division, uh, you know, exhibitions in there. And, you know, like, Given 10 bucks is just like one part of it, but come on, don't be a cheap ass. Like, like write a check. Come on. Like, let's go. This is like, this is, you know, this content and everything. Yeah. You can scam it. You can watch it on YouTube, like, you know, for free, but that's not what it's all about. Like it's about contributing. Right. So anyway, um, we're, this one right here is for me is just, I've been so excited about this all season long. So really excited to kind of get into this. And um, I just want to say today, I shredded Stowe, thought about Jake the whole time. This was my 20th day riding at Stowe, which doesn't sound that much because it really wasn't that great early season, but um, I worked for Burton for 20 years. So that was kind of cool. Uh, got some great pow shots, dropped in on a couple of little side country things that Jake showed me these lines. So I was like tripping the whole day, like thinking about, you know, Jake and, um, you know, this is the best time of the year. So uh, we had the ride for Jake day on Saturday and, uh, and Jake's wife, Donna, and his, his son, uh, Taylor, like we had 350 people bombed down the mountain and it was, you know, it's, it's really, it's a really touching event. And those events were happening all over the country. Like there were quite a few of them and, and actually all over the world, you know, that was kind of rad. And um, there's this funny event coming up this next weekend called Homesick down at Stratton. It's all these like washed up pros, little like half pipe event. There's a downhill and it's going to be fun. So if any of you guys want to, uh, you know, 
hark back to the 90s and or the in the 2000s come down to the homesick event down at stratton where it kind of all began and you saw a bunch of that in the film right so um i just want to go over my outfit just for a second because you're like what the fuck is this guy wearing sorry Oops. cowboy hat i would announce the us open always had to have the hat the flying disc Okay, Celtics, right? Jake Burton was a huge Celtics fan. And this says number 18. We're going for the 18th championship ring this year. And people don't know this. Maybe some do. But Jake Burton's wife, Donna, her family used to own the Celtics. So Jake's a huge sports fan, has courtside seats. And, like, they were so generous every once in a while that they'd, like, let you – you know, give you some tickets. So people from the company got a chance to do that. So that's where this, this kit, kit's coming from. I got my Cope ring on right here. I got my dollar sign here, which when I was repping, trying to make that money, sell those snowboards. And I got my fake 2008 Celtics ring right here. Cause Jake uh -huh. brought me to the garden in 2008 when the Celts won the championship. So that's what this whole getup is all about. Enough about me, right? Come on, there's way more going on here. I have a little rocks glass here. Jake handed these out, like, so generous, the company. Over Thanksgiving, they'd give out turkeys, like, to everybody. Jake was all about, like, premiumness. So I'm going to drink, keeping it real with Don Julio Real. Just like Joe Rogan, man. He he sips Buffalo Trace. I'm, I'm a little more bougie than he is. So I'm going for Don Julio Real. And like Rogan, but I won't do this right now, Rogan gets like Elon Musk high when he's doing some of the interviews. So I'll do this maybe at the end, maybe not. But we got a lot to talk about. So cheers to Jake. If you guys have a little sipper there, we could maybe start off. And all through the, the show, we could kind of, you know, inebriate. And also, it tastes better of a Simon Pierce um, hand spun glass. And there's the stories behind the Pierce name, too, for sure. You know, Kevin Pierce was one of the best riders in the world and rode for Burton. And his dad is Simon Pierce, who made these incredible glasses right here. It all ties together. It's all it's all about this. OK, now I'm going to talk about these three people right here because enough about my crap. Coxie. All right. Who is this dude? Right. So Coxie was a rep for Burton for. 25 plus years but he really parlayed himself into an incredible friendship with the family so he's almost like the fourth carpenter kid so jake and don have three kids but coxie is kind of like the de facto child and traveled all over the world it was a friend so i have to interrupt so, okay so all the burton boys have burton as their middle name so i was kind of like going hey maybe i could sneak in on this and jake's like it's got to be a family vote, and um, it didn't work. So I was <laughs> close. <laughs> close. <laughs> He's always trying to wedge himself into history, wedge yeah. himself in there. But very, very important, and you know, putting this project together. But now <laughs> these other two dudes, like I, just before I even ask them about their backgrounds, because nobody, nobody provided me with a bio. But I just want to say, watching this film many times this is my fifth time seeing it like just an incredible incredible job with the arc of this story and i'm going to get into this here but i want to hear your backgrounds but my biggest takeaway and i want to start off with this is for a 90 minute movie to tell history and it's not just the history of snowboarding it's the history of snowboarding from burton's perspective but everything in this film is true and this is what's crazy if somebody talked for 90 minutes, there's no way everything is true. What you guys put in that film, everything is true. There's nothing like, nah, that's that's not the way it happened. Or mm, they're kind of making a claim here. That that really wasn't the way it was. You guys got it right. And that's like just unbelievable in my perspective. So hats off to you. So I'm going to start off with you, Fern. Uh, I'm gonna, can I call you Fern? Or Yeah, yeah, Fern. Fern, call me Fern. Right. So I just... I read some one part of your bio that says that you're an Emmy award winning uh, filmmaker. So tell me a little about that and a little about your background and really how did you get this project? How did you get selected to do this project? Um, well, before I get into all of that, as far as far as you know, everything being true, um, you know, Donna said 
when we first started, he goes, you guys can put whatever you want in the film as long as it's true. Right. Okay. <laughs> so that so that was huge. Um, yeah, give me one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, background from Miami. Um, I was uh, been a film editor for twenty years. Ben Bryan, who's sitting right there, pulled me out of that dark cave and gave me a shot to direct something project that that they had, which is called An Any One of Us. And um, and yeah, Ben and I have been working together together since. And um, you, you know, when we were finishing that pro project, uh, Ben Ben was like, "Hey, do you know who Jake Burton is?" And I was like. No, he goes, you heard of Burton Snowboards. I'm like, yeah, kind of, because I'm from Miami. I'm from yeah. sea level. We don't do this stuff over there, right? <laughs> so then, um, um, uh, you know, I did, I started doing research and I did, um, you know, we set up a, Jake set up a few pitch meetings when he came through LA, right? And uh, so in preparation for that pitch meeting, I put together a proof of concept that, that when a, big way uh towards um well I, you know what was cool about it i think i think it was in a, a moment for jake to see his life interpreted through somebody else's point of view even if it was like like seven minutes and you know i think you did it, a seven minute pitch Is that yeah, yeah 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 thereabouts right because i didn't i didn't have any credits at that time who, you know who, like who told you what the arc of the story was like what what what, when oh, I just researched like, it. I just researched it. You did all that, or did you have like a crew and a team? That no, it was just it was just me and um, and uh, and the I had a friend help me a little bit with the visuals, but yeah, no, the information super highway. I just dove in. And you know, um, it's funny. Jake used to say like, you know, people would pitch him, and it, before it was about books, like somebody, a dude that wrote uh, John McEnroe's bi biography and stuff, and and. Jake was like, dude, so many of these dudes don't get it. Like, they don't, they don't know who I am. They don't know what snowboarding is. Like, I don't, I don't want just some clown, like, trying to tell this Burton story and not get it. And for you to get it is congratulations, man, because you get it, man, you know. But it was, cool. yeah, it was, um, it was great to have that initial meeting with, with Jake. And, um, you know, I mean, honestly, I didn't have any kind of, you know, illusions that I would get the job because, you know, Jake was meeting with established directors, but I really yeah. want, you know, and I, but I put a lot of work into it and I wanted to meet him and, and I knew I would, I would learn a lot from the experience. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I mean, you know, Jake, right. So I guess he even when, when I, when I went in the room, he did everything he could to make me feel comfortable, right. Yeah. To like, to make me feel like, ah, you know, like everything was cool, you know, and gave me some presents. And it was, um, it was just like a, such a magical moment. And uh, like, I, I, I don't have the best memory in the world, but I remember that moment very, very yeah. clearly. Do you, you know, um, and, um, were you doing stuff for Red Bull Media House? Were you do, or was it, no, you were doing stuff outside when you got it. Then it was, then it was I was it Red was a Red Bull. It, I was working with with Red Bull Media House okay, at the time. Yeah, yeah. we were finishing so, up the film. Ben, give me some of your your background, and then like, how how did you get roped in on this? And did you guys know each other? Yeah, so my background, I grew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, so a little bit south of the Canadian border there, like a little below uh, infamous Bald Face Mountain. Oh um, yeah, and uh, grew up snowboarding. Uh, just got a little taste for it and never looked back and figured out how to get up to the mountain and, you know, the Sorel boots with the duct tape and the whole deal. And, uh, you know, just had a real love and passion for not only snowboarding, but just outdoor recreation. Thought I was going to get a job, maybe doing some marketing, actually try to get a job for Burton right out of college. Uh, applied several times, ended up eventually getting a job doing distribution and marketing for outdoor sports films. And through that experience, I was able to work with a lot of the biggest brands in the space, uh, including Burton, 
um, and then uh, worked with a number of the CMOs at the time and then uh, worked with a lot of the independent filmmakers who were really like committing themselves to making films and skateboarding and snowboarding, et cetera. So the, the Mac hogs and the standards and, you know, oh, cool. that across all the different industries. So I really got a taste for filmmaking, I really got a taste for the film business, and I was working in a in an industry that I really wanted to be a part of, and uh, and so that was kind of my cutting my teeth. I got an opportunity to start a film division at Red Bull uh, in my early 30s. Moved to LA to do that, um, and I've been working there ever since. So I oversee all the documentary filmmaking that we do. Um, we have a lot of shared writers with Burton. We have a lot of shared friends, um, and I was just getting the feeling that Jake was. Um, approaching a time when he'd be interested in telling a story. He did a more in-depth piece with Pyong Chang. He did a How I Built This, which is one of my favorite podcasts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we put together a, a pitch and we went and pitched Jake without any directors attached and just said, you know, if this is something you're interested in doing, we would really love to do it. We believe we could build the right team around this and do it in a way where you can be involved and we can do justice to the story. Um, and, uh, you know, he saw the vision and he, he loved the vision. What year are we talking like, and uh, you know, like we'll get into the whole thing with his illness, but like wh where, what year did you guys pitch it? And then how long did you work on the project? Like, cause I know you like, as you were living it, like everything went sideways with his health and COVID and all this stuff. So like, when did you guys start? Like, what was the, what, when did it? Initial pitch was in 2018. 18, okay. Uh, we yeah. started working on kind of like a brief for the project and working with some of the people at Burton. Uh, Abby Young in particular was really yeah. involved. Uh, a couple others at the company were really involved. And so this kind of led to a, a fall meeting where we were able to go and, and kind of sit down with Jake and do a pitch. And initially it was going to be like, a lot of people from Burton. It was a little intimidating because it was like, you're in that Jake office layer in the back yeah, yeah. couches and he's not there. He's late. And there's like all these people who are supposed to be in this meeting, you know, like 15 people or something. And yeah. right before the meeting, Jake had Tracy kind of flush the room out and, and make it a real small, tiny room. And he shows up, you know, half hour fashionably late through the side door sure. uh, with Sparky. Which is great because we work with uh, Mark on the Travis Rice films and and other projects around Red Bull. He was so close with Jake, and he immediately kind of like played Switzerland and broke the ice and kind of vouched for us. And like yeah. um, from there, it was really about like what is your idea? How would this work? As opposed to like who the hell are you guys? Right um, on. Well, you know, like I I am a huge fan of the Red Red Bull Media House, but also just documentary films in general. And like the way you guys created this film one of my favorite parts about it is that like when i watched the anthony bourdain film and when i watched the jerry lopez film that patagonia put together like the yin yang of, Je of jerry lopez like having the person in their own voice kind of telling their story instead of all these sycophantic blowhards like oh he was so great oh he changed my life and then you guys didn't do that like you had jake talking you had donna talking like it's real. Like everything about it was real. And I was wondering like how much of a conscious decision it was to say, this is the style of how we're going to tell this story is really through the, the voice of, because you have so much content of him talking through history, you know, how did you, were you guys like sitting down and saying, this is the way we want to do it. Or it was Jake. Like, I want it. I want this stuff to be from my voice. There's sort of like two evolutions of development. So there was a long period where we developed with Jake directly and we were going through his archives and we were staying in the barn and we were spending some late nights uh, hanging out and, and shooting the shit and then hiking the mountain and doing the whole thing to really get to know one another, but also to like really go through the material. And we had Jake do an exercise where he broke his life down into sort of three different timelines. And we did this yeah. intentionally. One was as a historian of snowboarding, who's yeah. really lived a lot of this, what is his opinion of the major milestones within the sport? You guys um, nailed that. Nailed so there was that piece. There was the piece of like, what was the history of the company mm -hmm. and the major milestones there? And the third was his own life story as, as a human, as a man. And when you overlap those three, you could see that it's you know, when his son's being born, this th crazy thing's happening with the company and this other thing's happening with the sport. And and by forcing Jake to break them apart, 
um, allowed him to see it clearly and allowed us to like put those pieces together because your life doesn't happen in, in individual silos um, so and, and one often influences the other. Um, and so that was a really um, important step. And there was always a vision of having Jake tell his story. And there was going to be a thread coming in and out of Jake riding 100 days in the winter. Um, yeah. But really picking like half a dozen locations that represented different styles of snowboarding, different people, different places that were important to the journey. And that would allow us to push in and out of the backstory as he worked his way towards 100. And that was the original vision. Yeah. And obviously... <laughs> when Jake passed that that wasn't going to be possible to execute it in that way. But um, I think Fern coming into the process and taking those materials largely created with Jake and by Jake and like sort of reimagining what that could be and how Jake would still tell his own story, which was the intention was like a, a major thing right out of the gate. So I'll turn that over to Fern and he can talk about kind of yeah. how he was able to achieve that. You know, let me tap in again. So, when the project started, Fern wasn't the director, but Fern was also, his stock had changed in between. And Jake kept saying, talking about Fern and how he made an impression. And he said, I really want Fern involved in this movie. And he said it numerous times. And I kept telling Jake, I'm like, dude, he's like big time director now. And I said, I don't know, how, how would we pull a director in to help a movie when he's not directing? and I think it's an interesting story how that came about and Fern I think tells it best and 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 Donna and how how that came about. Yeah, I um well you know I sadly uh I came back on the project after Jake passed like short, shortly at, shortly after and yeah. um and we um we had this great weekend uh Breckenridge, right? Right. Um, it was it was Coxie and 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 um, and Timmy and George and and Abby Young and and Ben and we were up there and and we just broke it down like what's what's this film going to be like how are we going to how are we going to make it you know like what's yeah. the plan right and we're like we're going to make it we're going to have Jake tell the story yeah we're going to figure it out we're going to go through all every every single bit of archive let me and, bring this an up. interview that he did and we're gonna we're yeah. gonna create a narrative but the, the 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 wonderful thing is he had some really powerful interviews towards the end like the last few years right one with one on um on how i built this on npr and then and then another one on um for the olympics right this M and nbc which which tonally and content wise are totally completely different from the early interviews, right? With, but that we, we also use a lot, but these later interviews are so full of heart and so, so human, right? Yeah. And, um, and it, like, without those, I don't know if you would have been able to pull off what we pulled off, but thank God those, those interviews existed. Um, but yeah, that was the plan. That was the idea, you know, but, but we didn't know exactly, I mean, we went into it Ho hoping that it would be there and and it was you know thank god but uh yeah that was that that's how that happened well, let, let me bring this up too because you know i've known donna forever and donna to me is the like the shining light in this whole film like she is somebody that a lot of people in the world of snowboarding had no idea no idea her level of involvement with the brand since day one but you were able to interview her and bring out i don't know how she even could hold it together with some of the questions you asked and the and the information that she was you know willing to divulge and like things like i mean she came from a you know her family owned the celtics like people some people don't know that but she's an amazing woman as a business person like she told jake hey we're gonna go to middlebury we're gonna learn german because we're gonna make boards or we're gonna get business going over there that wasn't jake that was donna like people don't know that shit you know like you guys plugged in and and her like her vibrancy and you really understand like how amazing she is you guys did, nailed that but the archival footage that you guys have of, of yeah. jake the family but also like just the love story between those two is i i don't know how you wove that in there and like only people really people who know them 
know how special that relationship was, but if you guys could talk a little bit about that, because Donna just, I, I'm glad for her that people see that that company would not be where it is without her. And this is like a story where Jake, it's really about Jake, but when you watch this film, you see Donna is like this rock that was there and, and helped build that brand and the sport. Yeah, she was great. That, that, that interview was like, it was a, it was a long interview. It was like four or five hours and and she was like still dialed in, you know, and 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 just fed off her energy. We 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 knew where we were going with the interview. We had a plan, right? But um in those moments you, it's it's like a conversation, you know, you you feel you yeah, feeling somebody's energy and and sometimes the conversation you just let it go where it goes. And she was so open and and um, specific about the details of how it, you know, how she felt, how things happened, when they happened, and um, and it's a love story, you know. Mm. Like like my favorite part is kind of when when she gets introduced and Cox's introduction. I love that part too. But uh, <laughs> my but my favorite part is like is like you know you have that you have that like that 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 sexy blondie song playing, and then they're like young and chasing each other around the house it's kind of totally. it's kind of like almost like we shouldn't be looking at this stuff right <laughs> but um but it's yeah it's a it's such a such a window into into how much those those two loved each other and and um they you know it's just that that's that's one of my favorite things about about the film but you know that weekend the weekend that we interviewed donna we also interviewed um taylor timmy and george and mm -hmm. Coxie, there was that, that that was a there was a lot going on those few days, right? There was a lot of great energy, and um, yeah. and you know, um, yeah, I'm sure those interviews were tough for them. And, you know what? And, one thing that blew me away, like I thought, like I think I'm an insider, and I've seen a lot of the footage and all that. I had you guys had stuff I had never seen before, and I used to you know be part and look in the archives all the time. But anyway, when the, when Donna said, you know, hey. This house, and I've been in that house in Manchester, and they're like, it was cold. Jake, we didn't have insulation. We brought Jake would bring the mattress down and we would sleep in front of the fireplace just to get warm. And I'm like, people don't realize like how handmade and handcrafted this whole business was and how dedicated the two of them were. Like Donna could have been like, what am I signing up for? This guy's a joke. Like, I'm not going to sleep on the floor in a freaking cold house in Vermont in the winter. Are you kidding me? You know, but she was like in it to win it right from day one. So I just, the, the fact that you guys captured that and Donna was willing to share all of that was so awesome. And then, so let me go, let me go to this next one. Woody Harrelson. I mean, are you kidding me? Like that dude is like the baddest dude, <laughs> right? And, you got him narrating it. And then like your details of like Jake's handwriting, like Jake doesn't do computers. He handwrites notes, everything signed Jake. And like, you guys nailed so many really Rudy details. Like, tell me about Woody. Like, how did he get involved? And, and how did you guys, how, how was he to deal with? I'll let Ben start, but then I, I, I have a Woody story. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, Woody and Jake were homies. And Jake was like, you know, when the time comes, we had to ask Woody if there's something Woody could do that'd be helpful. And they were buddies. They'd meet up and hang out. And they were part of a little uh, poker circle. They played some poker when, when Jake would be in Hawaii and uh, some other infamous cats in that circle. It sounded like a really good time. So the friendship was there and it was genuine and real. Um, and when the time came, there was just this treasure trove uh, from the catalogs where Jake would write this article. And it was really our lead editor, Rose, who I think first flagged like, oh man, there's this amazing content here. And uh, she and Fern call like, so excited. Like, got the title. Like, we got, it. there's this whole other layer of Jake's voice that like hasn't come alive. How are we going to bring this to life? And like, you know, like voice actor could be a little bit creepy. Like what it should be somebody from the family. Should it be different people, different friends, like lots of iterations. Could it be somebody like Woody who isn't trying to pretend to be Jake, but is sort of embodying that part of the, the reads as this amazing actor and friend. And so we're like, let's give that a try. And we so approached um, Woody and he was game. Donna made the first introduction and he was um, excited to have the conversation. And so um, we, we tried it. It was, this was during COVID. 
as well. So like we weren't able to travel it. This is like the super lockdown early part of COVID. So Woody's going to do it in his walk-in closet and he's recording this kid's animation show. So he's like, I got a Zoom mic here. It's going to work out great. So we're, we're just like doing a video conference like this. He's not looking at the screen. He can't see the cuts. He doesn't understand the cadence. He's trying to sound like a cool California guy or a, a cool snowboard guy, I should say. And he, the cooler he tries to sound, the more Southern draw was, was coming out. <laughs> and uh, it just was not, it was not flowing, not working. And so there was a lot of concern. Uh, do you want to pick up the story here? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Woody's so this story. is Doc. So and this we're is looking Don's at, we're looking at Woody's uh, whole wardrobe, by the way. We're in his walk-in closet. We're like seeing all his clothes here. So yeah, <laughs> kind of funny. So this is, yeah, it, for starters, this is Donna's favorite story of the whole, like behind the scenes making of. So, uh, I was super nervous, right, to do this uh, recording session, right? Because I'd never directed an actor before. I mean, I've taken acting classes and, but not like anything like working with a, an actor like Woody, right? So I was super nervous. And, and that first st session lasted like 25 minutes and, and he just kind of like ripped through it. And, and, and when it was over, you know, Ben's like, do we get it? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we got it. I just kind of let him do what, what he, he, what he wanted. And then when, when, when I tried to cut it together, it wasn't working like at all. It wasn't working at all. And so I'm like, nah, you know what? Let's, let's, let's figure out another solution. And Ben's like, no, nah, I got to give it another shot. Got to give it another shot. So then I was like, all right, the next, the next time it was in a proper recording studio in New York where he was, he was on location and he came in and he thought it was going to be the same thing, right? But this time I was prepared. Like I had really prepared and I had already, you know, been through it once with him. So he, he did the first line and then, and then, and he was like, what's next? I'm like, no, that was great, but uh, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And this time, so then I started giving him a very specific direction to the point where, you know, like, I was very, very clear as to how I had it in my head, how it should work out. Um, by the time it was over, he was so frustrated with me that he took the, the headphones off and just threw them down. Right. <laughs> We're like, Oh my God, we pissed off Woody Harrelson. Like, I didn't know that was possible, but, um, but it. then, then, then when we came out, like, like a moment later, he came out and he was really nice and he said bye to us. But then when we cut it together, it was great, you it know, was. and it was, and it wasn't, wasn't like anything that I did. It was, it was, I, but like, I didn't give him any real direction the first time. The second time, you know, he's such a pro and he's so good at that sort of thing that he just made it come to life in this real, his really special way. Um, and especially, I love the later ones. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the way you guys opened the film at the last U.S. Open in Vail and the way you closed the film with the with everybody dropping in the pipe and whoever selected the music, incredible. But that like spacey EDM freaky music where these dudes are boosting and then like Woody's voice comes in and like. Oh, like the quote at the end is like such a dagger, like do whatever the fuck you want. I, I'm just like, that's yeah. it. That is it. That's like the banger ender. Like the way that was put together was so badass, you know, like I love that. But anyway, let me go. Let me go into this. So this gets into a little more of the minutia, like the selection of the interviews and how much footage you guys must have like so many people, like you could have interviewed thousands of people and I'm sure you interviewed so many that didn't make the cut. But what I loved was on the pro riders that you guys selected um, really like the, the arc of the history of the most important riders uh, from that were Burton riders. Like you had Andy Coughlin in there, right? And Andy Coughlin is the first pro rider who signed a board, right? So, so important to have in there. Mark Heingartner, like the roots of teaching the world how to snowboard. Like Mark Heingartner is just like, people don't realize how influential and important that dude was. But from Andy Coughlin, then it, like kind of, he was like pre-snowboard, professionalism then and then when you guys told the sims versus burton story like banger spot on like that is exactly the way it was and how craig came on to burton and that craig was this 
you know, the dawn of pro snowboarding, like real global pro snowboarding and the whole Craig thing. There's so many layers to it. There's so much there. And I think you guys, you know, were very thoughtful and being able to present exactly the way Craig came on to Burton. And then, you know, then you had Hawkinson in there and Terry Hawkinson was kind of like the Jordan of the sport. It just otherworldly in the way he rode and the way you zoomed in on him on that interview where like, he was shook, you know, like you guys, you guys got right at him and for him to explain Burton and Jake, especially, and then Sean White, the same thing. Like, I don't know how you guys did that in those interviews, but Sean was like, whoa, like Jake was the one and the reason why, you know, I was driven to win. And Jake was a competitor, man. You know that he, it was all about winning and you guys nailed those interviews with those riders, the, the key people on the arc of like the history of snowboarding from Burton's perspective, those dudes, you had it, you had the whole thing right there. It was incredible. You know, I think, I think Jake meant, meant a lot to all, to all of them. You know, yeah. they, 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 he was a friend, he was a confidant. He was there, the person who gave, gave them the, the platform to achieve the things that they achieved. And um, I, I, I feel like, I had the feeling like they all felt like they owed some something to Jake, hmm. and and they didn't hold back in, in any in 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 the interviews. You know, there was a written. It's different. Those interviews felt different than than yeah. than other interviews. Ben, yeah. when when you're from Coeur d'Alene, did you ever ride did, with Keith Wallace? Did you know him? He's from Coeur d'Alene. I, didn't, I didn't know Keith. No, because he and Greg were super tight. Those dudes were probably older than you too. I think maybe. Right. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think I got introduced to the sport around like 1990. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, but I was young buck um, yeah. at the time. So uh, the probably the most famous snowboarder I knew that came out of Coeur d'Alene was uh, Jeff Yates. I don't know if that oh. name rings a bell. I, I do. I do remember that from a long time. Um, but in terms of riders, too, Jake did have a hit list. I mean, Coxie can expand, but he had a lists of people he said no matter what these people need to have voice in the film they yeah. were really instrumental in these ways at these times and i don't want to just focus on the men too because kelly was also on that list yeah. somebody who was kind of a uh, really instrumental in her time and even with sean he like was very adamant that sean should have a strong place in the film yeah. um even though he wasn't with the brand anymore and some of the other writers who weren't burton writers that he really bonded yeah. with and respected over the years even though they didn't ride on his boards and i think that says a lot about what kind of story jake was looking to tell coxie talk about that a little bit like the the selection of those riders in the interviews and all that were you with yeah. those riders on the interviews the fun part was trying to track them down and yeah. it was like uh, where's waldo kind of thing <laughs> and then when we did the, the thing that strikes me is what we just talked about is the 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 kind words and the respect that these people had and me as a fan of the sport and in the sport, I would, I would think some of the competitor riders would be like, you know, fuck Burton, fuck Jake, whatever. And then, but the amount of respect that those, those people have for Jake. And like you said, that, that the inspiration that he provided, but it was really fun to try to find them and then find someone who knows them and then find a phone number. And then, a, you know, it wasn't just going on Facebook and, you know, it might be eight times and someone finally got Sean Palmer. And Well, see, that was the thing, right? To me, yeah. when, when you had Palmer and Kidwell in yeah. that, it, like, those two guys, like, when you were talking the whole Sims thing, like, history is written by whoever won. Like, so Burton won, right? Like, if you asked Terry Kidwell, tell me the history of snowboarding, it's going to have a lot of these same things. But it's, like, this story is the history of snowboarding from – the victor, which is Burton, and like, but the arc and everything that happened in it is true. But for you to have Sean Palmer and Kidwell, but then you had uh, Pat Bridges in there, who is the ultimate like Switzerland of like he he didn't side with one brand or the other. Like, because you know when he ran snowboarder and now you know it, you know with his his projects he's doing now, but he's the best true historian of the whole sport and you guys brought him in there and when he told stories it was like oh yeah this isn't like from burton's perspective this is actually this is the history of it and and hearing sean palmer and terry and having kidwell in there and that footage you had 
was like, oh, this is this is it. Burton versus Sims, East versus West, Alpine snowboarding versus freestyle. That whole transition, like that's that's the truth. That's exactly what happened mm -hmm. in the sport. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, anyway, so like the thing that I want to go into from there was a little bit about Europe, like just switching gears, right? So I don't think enough people in the States realize like how important having Europe and even Japan as well, like those places where Burton invested to help build the company and drive the company. And you have Herman in there. Um, the only rider I wished had a little bit, a little voice was Peter Bauer because he had such a massive influence on Burton in Europe, but globally also. But like, talk about Herman a little bit. Like, I, I think his story is still so integral and Kyle and Jake and Donna going over there. Like that whole thing is just, people don't really know that, you know? And I think you guys did touch on that well in the story. I don't know who wants to maybe pick that one. I think like my favorite, I think Donna definitely stole the show. And I, my second favorite was Herman. And when, and like you said, having the, that footage of those guys barbecuing oh, yeah. four years ago. And then when, uh, you know, Jake says, we're going to lose all this money together. And then Herman's like, yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, wait, what do you mean we have a deal? I didn't even read the thing yet. But that <laughs> perseverance of Jake and yeah. and then Herman seeing the opportunity and how they came so close together from the very start and built the whole the whole thing over there, you know? And yeah. I think Donna says it best that, you know, and the thought, everyone thinks we went there to have boards made, which we did. But then all of a sudden the orders started coming in from there. And that's when Donna was like, we need to learn German. We need to get over there. We need to spend all the time there and, and yeah, build and that. They moved over there, you know, like they, Jake was going to the factories getting these made. But Donna at like 23, 24 years old is setting up international distribution deals with Switzerland and Italy and France. And everyone's like, how can yeah. this young woman like come in and just be like doing this stuff? Like that history is what people don't know. And I think you guys glimpsed, you know, showed people that that was part of it. You know, I thought that was, that was awesome. Um, and Donna but, also tells stories of the, the, the chauvinistic male point of view back then in <laughs> Europe and them thinking she doesn't understand or doesn't speak the language. And she would just call them out after, you know, she'd listen and then, just go right back at them and you know the uh, other thing that i don't think people know is that like burton used to produce that catalog in five languages like it was italian french spanish japanese and german mm -hmm. you know and it's like who does that like even today like people they don't put catalogs out or have websites in all these different languages you know like burton they understood business on such a different level than the not only the rest of the snowboard industry but businesses in general you know and um so that leads to another one like the i think you guys did a really good job put, you know putting the patent the burton patent out there because that's another one that i think the history is misunderstood on that and how, how much did jake want to talk about that and and or not really kind of emphasize that but i think the amount you put in there was was proper you know yeah, jake knew Hart burton <laughs> Jake knew that we are going to want to cover some of the highs as well as the lows, some things yeah. he might do differently or would perceive as missteps. And uh, he knew that was going to be an important part of the storytelling. So it had credibility um, as opposed to like, here's this guy who's amazing and he just gets better as the movie goes along, you know, yeah. um, because that's what really makes you lean in and want to cheer for him. Um, and he realized that and understood that. And, you know, he's very forthcoming about the patent story and, Kind of a funny story about it. We did didn't um, ever sit him down to camera. We intended to, um, but it didn't happen in the timetable before he passed, and just how suddenly that all came about. So, um, but one thing we did was we did some audio interview, uh, kind of pre-interview work, just to get some research. And half of it, there's like hip hop and other things playing in the background, or he's hiking and huffing and puffing and telling uh, off-color jokes and whatever. And so it's not wasn't intended to be used, but um, in in part of the sessions too, he did talk about the patent and we went into detail about it. And, um, you know, it was clear that while he was being opportunistic and also protecting his own company, um, you know, he, he saw it as an opportunity to pull one over on Tom, uh, yeah. you know, chief rival. And so when we had pre presented the cut 
initially that was one thing that caught Donna a little off guard and she was sort of poking holes at it just saying is this really how it happened this wasn't really how I remembered it and we had brought it up and showed you know this is this came from Jake this is how he told us this story and as soon as that became clear it was like then 100 percent use it but I think maybe as either she remembered it or his telling of the story to her it was a little more noble it was a little bit more for the protection of the industry to protect against black snow and other outsiders oh, coming yeah. in and that's a real threat but you know there was there he was a little vindictive in it in the whole oh, operation yeah. too and as soon as like uh, to her testament as soon as that became clear it was like then 100 percent use it yep. like I just wanted to make sure to fact check you guys all right. I want to go into this one. Like to me, one of the top three people in my 33 year relationship with Burton Snowboards is Michael Jagger. And Michael Jagger, your your interview with Michael Jagger was killer. And Michael says, you know, the 90s were about all about destroy to create music, art, sport, punk, hip hop, like all coming together. Like there was this there was this moment like. Heavy metal music was kind of like late 80s kind of dying. Then what's next? It was like then grunge hit and then hip hop was coming on. White dudes could listen to hip hop. And then it was like clothing, baggy, skate, like surf, action sports became a thing. And Jagger like really coalesced around like design and art and putting real art on snowboards, not just wacky graphics. And Michael Jagger is just, that dude's a visionary man. And like- his voice, it was so important in Burton's, you know, success. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know how much time you got to spend with Michael or if you plugged into his magic, but mm -hmm. he's, he's. I love Michael. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought him up. I think, you know, he's one of my favorite uh, characters in the film, but he's also just such a good guy, you, cool. you know, so smart so elegant you know he like looks like a designer like like <laughs> the guy's got the guy's the guy's dialed in and and um that definitely looks good for his age you know he told me how old he was i'm like what um <laughs> he's 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 um he's he's such a cool cool guy but yeah he just his insight into that late 80s and the straight of create and and just, you know, the fact that they had all those crazy logos, hmm. right? Like, he goes, who does that? He goes, nobody no, does yeah, that. Exactly. that. That's suicide, right? Broke and, every um, rule. Yeah, he broke broke, broke every rule. But, um, you know, how he pushed, how Jake pushed them, you know, to, like, find that edge, right? The, mm -hmm. That edge between, you know, going too far and not far enough, um, uh, which I think for an artist is essential that you have that support you know, that, 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 you know, cause it's, it's not always the case, I imagine. Um, but his, his whole, he's so like, he's such kind of like a mic dropper and how, in like his, you know, his, his lines, right. How he, how he talks. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I thought, I think it was a big, uh, um, you know, uh, addition to the film. I just wanted to say like, Coxie was my secret weapon, you, you know, like, as far as like the things that happen, who, what, I would send Coxie cuts late at night, you know, um, and he would always watch them whenever I send it to him. Hey, I was like, look, what is this? Does this look good? Does this, you know, is this kind of how how it went down? So Coxie was always like my first line of defense, right? And um, and we had many late night chats about these early edits. I I think you you saw every single version of every scene. I'm sure pretty much yeah you know it, it's funny because i it, the first time i watched it i was like super long and super emotional and we talked and then the next cut would come and and i talked to ben and i talked to fern and i talked to him separately at times and it's like don't tell ben but and then don't tell <laughs> fern but and then <laughs> then it got super late and i'd get you know a little little this little that and i'd wake up the next morning i had these crazy notes everywhere and then be embarrassed and call Fern. I'm like, dude, could you even understand what I was talking about last night? And I'm like, you know, 106 minutes in that whatever, do you really think blah, blah, blah? And like, it was kind of crazy. But I think to your point, Chris, of how true everything is, like yeah. George would watch the cuts, Abby, um, Donna, and then we'd discuss. And then some stuff that was really cool, we'd be like, I don't think Jake would like that. And then 
these guys would come back and take it out or change it or whatever. But it was, it was hours and hours. And my respect for filmmaking, and I always used to wonder why it's, you know, 300 names after a movie. <laughs> right. And, oh, <laughs> and the detail and telling the, the, the movie in Jake's voice, literally. Sure. And yeah. Just the editing of that. But, um, but yeah, it was a, a, a definitely a passion project okay. and it, yeah. It was great. What a pro what a yeah. what a process. Well, yeah, dude, know, we, I, I got to give one more little plug to okay. Jake. As at the tail end of the film is always when you're kind of running out of like shells to move around and like yeah. running out of time and money and whatever. And the, right now. Our, our graphics were not uh, cohesive with the film. We couldn't get it. The woman that we had was very talented, but it just wasn't connecting. It wasn't yeah. happening in the way that was serving the film. And uh, we ended up pulling kind of a, like a last minute rabbit out of the hat and actually brought Jagger in to help us um, oh, like create a graphic identity, um, that handwritten font. You know, we were told, oh, this is going to take X amount of time. It's going to be so, like in a weekend. It's like, here's your font. It's like all based on Jake's exact Jake's handwriting. Yeah, build yeah. Anything we wanted and the, the animated signatures and the title treatment. And so like having someone that connected and passionate about it and like yeah. come in and just deliver it in like a matter of a couple of weeks, what we weren't able to do in half a year. It was phenomenal. All right. Here's the thing. We got about 10 minutes and I, here's my agenda here. I want to talk Olympics and then I want to talk about Craig passing away, which is a whole other deal. And then I want to get into Jake's health. So that's a lot of stuff to go. So on the Olympics, I just want to put the arc together. Jake was never a fan of the Olymp of like put this push for the Olympics. But then when it happened and it wasn't done right, you guys captured that. And then when Salt Lake came around and that Ross Powers, the bionic massive method, Kelly Clark winning the first gold medal, the U.S. team sweeping it, and then the whole arc of Sean White. And it's like, it was so weird to like see Jake. He's like, he's so competitive and he wants to win, but he's also like, eh, you know, the Olympics. And he totally supported Hawkinson saying, the best rider in the world saying, you know what, dude? Nah, I'm not doing this. That FIS thing, I don't want anything to do with it. Like, how, like, did, when you guys were talking to him about it, did he, like, explain his whole, like, really complex relationship with the Olympics to you guys? I mean, I think you, you captured it, but I'm just wondering if how that came across to you guys when you were interviewing him about that. I think I think most of that content was from uh, prior interviews, hmm. but it was pretty clear his point of view on the whole thing, right? And yeah. I think I think the idea that that he basically they, they i guess everybody in in the industry just basically read about it one day in in the newspaper and none of them were consulted was definitely starting off on the wrong foot you, you, you know but um yeah i think uh but it's he i yeah you know he's a, he's a visionary so he knew the importance of it yeah he knew like if it was done right the value it would have to the sport and to the writers mm -hmm. yeah i think you guys really i think you the way you told the story and the, and those three like chunks of it were were right on. But let me let me go into the Craig Kelly thing because this is just you know Craig is like an anti-hero and he's kind of like the really the soul of the sport of snowboarding. And when you know I was the team manager when it was this push where Craig was he had to compete. They had to do slalom. They had to do giant slalom. They had to do I mean even moguls back then were part of snowboard competition and you know craig won four world titles and jake wanted that but then like craig was like dude i'm walking away from this and like the the marketing director at the time dennis jensen really powerful dude and dennis is super competitive and you know jake was like dude if he wants to walk away and he's done with snowboarding like competitively and he's gonna go in a new direction jake wasn't thrilled initially but he said hey man i'm listening to the riders i'm gonna listen to him and that was just like pretty massive that a company would let the dude at the top of their game walk away from competitive snowboarding. And, you know, they had Hawkinson and Brushy and all these other dudes in, in the hopper. But, wow, like Craig just, you know, he, he changed the sport by walking away and saying it's not really about just the competition, man. It's about like free riding and just, enjoy, you know, enjoying the moment and being in the mountains, you know. And I know you guys obviously – watched a bunch of footage of Craig, but I, I like the pieces that you put in there with Craig and some of the interviews. And I don't know, like 
talking to Donna and Jake about Craig, like I'm sure those were really, really great interviews and time you spend talking about him. Yeah. I mean, it, it's in the film as well, and it's earlier in the film, but what Jake says he learned from Craig and talked a lot with us about was, um, you know, just how to listen to the writers and how to take that feedback. And it is important to Jake, and that's not just uh, sort of a PR campaign. It's like he does these workshops. He does these athlete meetings. He gets product feedback. He So, you know, to the people who want to compete, he understands the value of competition. He's a competitor himself, and he does like to win, and he supports their hopes and dreams. And for the people who like to free ride, same thing. And, like, he loves building community, but he also believes in the power of the individual and individual choice. And I think you see that across the riders who still represent the brand today and even how close Jake is with some of the non-Burton athletes or, yeah. or was with some of the non-Burton athletes. He had massive respect. Um, in that way and it's not a one size fits all that's totally true all right now we have to get to like kind of the whole deal with I mean I mean we could go into the Sean White thing I mean one thing that wasn't really covered in the film but when Burton acquired Forum there was all that stuff but that's that doesn't really change the arc of the sport but the Sean White thing I think is you know, just seeing like the most competitive, the v, the very best person, a person who transcended the sport. Like he is a rock star and took snowboarding to places that nobody could have even imagined. And I think even if some riders aren't like, oh, Sean's my favorite rider. It's not about that. It's like, hey, that kid dedicated his life, put his life on the line, hucking those in those pipes. And Jake respected that. And he was like, hey man, this guy, is really helping the sport and helping in so many ways. So I, I was really, I love the way you guys covered Sean and put him in the film uh, because he's, he transcends the sport. He's really important. Mm -hmm. but anyway, I want to talk about the health stuff because the stuff that you guys put in that film was heartbreaking and like seeing him in the hospital and like, you know, it was, it was heavy, man. And like, him writing the notes and like just some of those images, like, did he approve that? Or did like Donna say, yeah, yeah, we're going to let's, let's let that. Let's have that in the film. Cause most people, they had no idea that what Jake was struggling with, you know, in that film, it's just like, Oh my God, it's just heartbreaking seeing that, you know, how, the, how the, the, those decisions made, like putting that stuff in there, seeing somebody at their worst, you know, right at the edge of life and death, you know, well, actually, the the going back to the proof of concept that I made was ba was by and large cent centered around the the Miller Fisher um, story because that's kind of when I was when I you know you can't put a lot in seven minutes but I felt like I could do something with that to to tonally and then uh, um, some of the imagery that I use in there I actually is is in the film and ended up in in the film and so. Yeah, he he already saw me like he saw like a, a version of that scene in a sense. Um, so, but as far as as far as I mean, I never. Uh, I mean, that was part of the story. We was never like I don't think we remember conversations about whether or not that would be in the film or not. I mean, it was always going to be in the film. It was just a matter of like how do you make something like that work, right? It's such it's such a you know being like locked in in your own body. It's a uh, it's uh, but it's all about it's all about him, his need to connect, you know, and him writing those 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 notes and 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 uh, that that uh, and there's an arc in those notes where like from despair to hope, right? Yeah, and 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 even in the in the lowest moments, his humor still came through, like Kachi's joke, right, about the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it is fantastic, right? So, I mean, you know, to have your personality and your sense, you know, come come out through those through those notes and how Timmy says he learned more from those, learned more about his dad from those notes than than than, than, than any other time in his life. That that was well, um, at his funeral service. Hearing all three boys get up and and memorialize their father was unbelievable like that those kids could stand up there in front of whatever six seven hundred people and say the things that they said and be able to keep it together was wow like i was so blown away by 
those three. And, um, you know, it was just like you guys captured the whole, you know, the, the arc of the, you know, of, of that part of his life that most people didn't know. But like, uh, Coxie, like the decisions for some of those images and photos like were you involved with that like jake do you really do you want us to use this was he was he around when those decisions were made or he's like yeah man i want that in the film that's part of it or no was he well a lot of them a lot of some of the big stuff he had gone through and approved and here's a whole bunch of slides here's some stuff and the the interesting thing is when there are certain images i had no idea but you have to find out who took the picture when get their yeah. approvals and um you know, legal and sign-offs, and that was a, another learning thing, but there was a few of them where I'd be like, oh, yeah, I took that picture, just run it, or whatever, at the end, where it was like, mm -hmm. hey, picture, it's like, there's a little risk, but um, yeah. like I said, he just wanted his life story told, and, and Donna and the boys were 100% supportive, and I just want to say about Fern and Ben, the amount of respect that they had and have for the family, and and what they were going through and the timing of it was amazing. Yeah. It wasn't forced or rushed or anything. And where, you know, it was truly remarkable um, of how they put this thing together in 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 a really tough moment in in the family's life, you know. You know, there's a there's a logo from Burton that's that bent arrow and it's called the process. Of course, Jagger came up with it, right? And you guys went through a process with this film. The brand went through this process, and it's like it starts up here with an idea, then it turns into you know product. The product gets tested, it goes out into the market, then feedback happens. It's good, it's bad. Change this, change that, and it's this cyclical thing. And so the Burton process, right? And I always love that about Jake was that like he was a really good listener, not only a leader, but he was a great listener, and he would listen to people you know, that maybe don't really have as much credibility as you think they should have. But I always love that about him. And I think one of the things that you guys, you know, really captured, like at the end of the film, where you were like, with the US Open and the riders all drop in at the same time. And that whole moment, it was just surreal watching the ending. And you're like, this is, I think Sal Masekela was saying it. It's not a memorial. This is a celebration, right? That was very, very cool. And then the fireworks going off and stuff. And the last line, it's like it was about freedom, right? And it was about do whatever the fuck you want. Like, that's so Jake. Like, and I'm like, man, what a dagger of an ending. Like, you guys just... That was it. Like that. Well, was, that was Jake's like, last like, year writer. That was those words were approved in the writer book, which was a short catalog that he sent to print when he was in the hospital mm. in November, and uh, those were the last ones that he wrote. So it's like let Jake have the last word. Those were the last ones he put out to the community, and he signed it and ran it as is. So one thing I wanted to say about the process with the family and with Coxie and Abby and everyone who surrounded this film and put so much into it, we agreed with Jake we would get it all, and we could always pull it back, and it was going to be a partnership, and he would have a seat at the table. But, like, we wanted it all, and it had to be an open book. And when Jake passed... Um, everybody really contributed and picked up Slack in different ways and contributed in different ways. But um, George stepped into those shoes on behalf of his father and on behalf of the family. And he really took a strong leadership role in the process. And that had to be extremely hard based on everything that he was going right. through, both personally and with the company, uh, et cetera. So um, huge hats off to, to George as well. I want to show this photo right here. This is my favorite with Jake. Right here, <laughs> but this guy John Yusko, who was our one of the best reps ever, he said to me when I put that photo up online, he said, "When you ride with Jake, he's like you feel twenty years younger." And he said, "I've never ridden with somebody who is more passionate about snowboarding than Jake," and that's super true. And that's in the film too. Like when they said, "Hey, why is why didn't Jake ever sell the company? Why did it never go public?" How can a company stay a private company? And Jake was like, 
because no, if I would never sell it unless somebody loves snowboarding more than I do. And there's nobody on the planet that loves snowboarding more than I do. So wh- I'm not selling it. And Donna reflects that same attitude today. And I'm like, dude, that's unique. Like they, he, they could have made bazillions of dollars selling this brand and lived their life and snowboard their asses off forever. But that's not what they wanted to do. They're like, no, we own this brand. We're not selling out. And I love that love that about those dudes you know that family jake's vision donna kids like the whole thing what a what a story man what an arc and you guys for a 90 minute film there's so much more that could have been in there but you guys cut it and made it like that thing when you watch that film it goes so quick and you're like what a ride man what a ride you know it's sick love it so anyway i think we have actually if there's more stuff you guys want to drop in here we got a few minutes and then we'll drop into some of these Q and a, I think Abby will come back on and we can get some uh, question and answers going here. Um, we can but I think like you out. said, it's a, it's a love story. It's a story of Jake's life. It's a business story. It's a motivational story. It's like, like three of the best movies in one, you know, but I think the yeah. love story part is, you know, Jake's and Donna's love for each other. And then, the love for the family, the love for the sport, and and the business. Absolutely. Here's a here's a couple questions. So here's one. It says, any plans to sell the documentary on iTunes, DVD, or Redbox? The film was done in partnership with HBO. So we split the bill with them. They believed in the vision up front. They believed that we could deliver it and support it as sight unseen, which is amazing. And uh, so HBO has the film in uh, North and South America. Uh, Red Bull fit uh, footed the bill of the rest of the world and Universal's doing that distribution. So in other territories, it's available in other ways. In North America specifically, it's only available on HBO. And they did put it on some of the airlines for a while last year, which was really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's super cool. Here's one from Barry Dugan, who actually used to work for Burton and the team stuff. And he's putting on the, the big homesick event next weekend down at Stratton, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, he says to the producers, was there a specific moment while you were deep in this, assembling the content when you realized how selfless, driven, and extraordinary Jake was? That's a good question, Barry. I mean, was there a moment where, where when you just realized, like, wow, <laughs> I thought I knew this dude, but now as I'm getting into it, you know, how selfless, driven, and extraordinary. That that's the question right there. And yeah, I mean, as as we were as we were listening to the to the interviews and watching the interviews and and it yeah, it starts to come through pretty quickly, you know. I mean his passion is like unmatched. Exactly. Like, yeah. And he I think he surrounded he surrounded himself with people who had passion like he did. Yep. You know, yep. and uh and so I think all that, the drive, the the commitment, like all that is 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 under the umbrella of the passion, I I believe. And um, which is, you know, is kind of I guess what he learned from his father, you know, early on, right? It mm. doesn't matter what you do as long as you have passion for it. Um and I think it was for me at least, I realized a lot of it, a lot of um what made Jake who he was, was had to do with a lot of the trauma that he suffered when he was, or he went through when he was young, losing his brother and losing his mother while he, when he was a teenage teenager and, um, and made him a, you know, super independent person, mm. but also somebody, you know, it's like that dichotomy, super independent, but he also want, wanted community. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, for me, it was like, you feel you connect. You connect with someone, and it's really special. And I felt that way when I met Jake, and was somebody I had looked up to. And I was like, "Oh man, I gotta hit this out of the park." It's like everything we've done to this point has prepared me to crush this thing. Like we're gonna, we're gonna do it. It's gonna be great. But um, you meet so many other people who felt that they had this amazing connection or the super special moments, and like he was able to make lots of people feel that way. And I think that's really a testament to who he was. And when you see that home video, him just being that video dad, directing from the other side of the camera, the boys, the shenanigans, there's so much that couldn't go in the film, but would make its own amazing film. Uh, um, you, know, you just, 
you see that like real joy for life and the passion, just like any other person. So. so another part to that question from Barry says, for me, Cope, it says, share a special moment that you had riding with Jake in the 80s or 90s. I'll do, give a quick one. And then I want I want Coxie because Coxie's got probably a million of them. So you be thinking about this, but I'll share mine. I was riding a chairlift in Austria during a sales meeting and all the you know, people from all over the world are riding out of the chairlift. And I said, Jake, when you look down and you see all these people, like, does this just like stoke you out? Like, wow, I built this thing and it's this global thing now. And he goes, I lose sleep over it, man. It, it, it freaks me out. He's like, I am responsible for the livelihood and the lives of these people make this money to have their family, to have this as a career. He goes, and his famous line, don't fuck it up. Like, he's like, I just don't want to fuck it up. And I was like, whoa like so real man and that's true and he always told us as reps he's like you got to take this so seriously and i'm giving you a lot of opportunity to drive this business and make some money and and push this brand forward but don't fuck it up man so anyway coxie i gotta hear your story i'm sure you have a million of them so well, what's a couple, the special moment you had riding couple, with jake quick ones like i think cope you were there like stew by glacier like in 1990 or 91 yeah and I'd never been on a T-bar. And the, my first time on a T-bar, I go in and Jake swoops in and he's like, scoot over. And I'm like, no. I'm like, he's like, scoot over. And I was freaking out, whatever. And he's like, relax, relax, relax. And I barely made it up. And that was the biggie. And then also like at Bolton Valley, you know, pushing, getting off the lift and pushing into the, the down ramp and always pranking. But I think my favorite time with Jake was – we would travel a lot together and sometimes we'd be arguing and fighting about business or personal stuff or work or, you know, I picked the wrong parking spot or whatever. And when we, we would get on a lift and have that little quiet time, you're adjusting your goggles and your gloves. And he'd look over at me and he'd be like, Coxie, he's like, we're fucking snowboarding today. He's like, yeah. how lucky are we? And he would smile and he would be right for the, the, the next week, like this favorite thing. And no matter what was on his mind, personal health, business, whatever, going up that lift and looking back and then shredding was made everything right. And, and 100 days of riding is gnarly. I rode 50 days like three years ago. It's, it's insane that he – Impossible. Half of those are hiking. He would hike, and hiking sucks, and he's Ooh. loved it. You know. All right, here's a quick one, too. It says, if you had to boil your feelings about Jake Burton down to one word, what would it be? For me, it would be visionary. What do you got for a word? You want to think about it? Or you Love. Want to figure it out there? Love. Ooh. Love. All right. You guys got one, Ben or Fern? You got anything? I'm going with passion. Yeah, dude. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, survivor. Ooh, that's heavy too. Yeah, you know, I want to I want to talk a little about about this love that Coxie just mentioned because we Coxie and I did did have one big disagreement on the film. Right. <laughs> it was like I I don't even remember towards the end of the film. There's there's a scene um, after Jake. Pa passes where we do a, a, a scene where we see kind of moments of his life right and it's a fiona apple song that we're using and and, and the song and and um and coxie wasn't feeling the song right when <laughs> the first time he heard it uh but the song is i want you to love me yeah right and and um and the first time i heard that song i that scene i saw the scene in my head like instantly you know because that up until then the end of the movie wasn't really was it really working? Okay. Um, but then, but yeah, but that, that song did catch Coxie off guard a little bit, right? I didn't and, love that song myself, but when I listened to the lyrics, I like Fiona Apple's voice, but I listened to the lyrics and I was like, damn, they nailed that song, man. You did. Mm -hmm. That was, did you pick that or did somebody else pick that song? Well, my wife played it when we, we, we were, we, we, took a, we took a trip for my birthday and she played it. And I'd never heard it before. And um, and as soon as she played it, it's like that that happens sometimes when you're making a movie. Yeah. Just you just you just get it, right? And then uh and then I was like, I couldn't wait to get back home and I cut it like right away. Uh, uh but I think um, you know, I think those lyrics 
I want you to love me is is um you know I, I, how I see see that is Jake Jake wanted to have that community around him. He wanted to have that that he wanted to bring people together, right? And I think it goes back to you know lo losing his his mom and his and his brother early on. Um, so I you know I I always thought it was a perfect song, but like Kai Cox was like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, said, dude. This I is think crazy. I said, a big meeting. I'm like, what is this Lilith fair? I'm like, Jake would have wanted hip hop or something. And then <laughs> like Liz and my daughter, everyone's like, it's a beautiful song. And, and ironically, and I feel the same way as you, Chris, after listening to it, it's like, that's the fucking yeah. pulled together. But one of the awards that the movie was up for was best sound score or yeah, soundtrack. For sure, but, man. Don't ask me. Like, I'm all wrong. Here's a funny story. When I started at Burton in 89, we would get, I was trying to help out in the marketing department, which was only one other person. And people would call and like, yeah, we want to do a story on Burton boarding. Yeah. And we're like, no, it's not called Burton boarding. It's called snowboarding. And Jake could have gone down that path and promoted Burton boarding and it never mm -hmm. and Jake was always like it'll never become a sport if my, if it's just my name on it and it can't be carpenter boarding it's not it's Burton but it's snowboarding it's not Burton boarding and that was like that was really it's smart scary. of him most people would have an ego and go yeah man Burton boarding this is this is our sport he goes this would turn into what do you call what do you call it um kite surfing you know uh, no uh no um when you jump off with the uh, what do they call it? Um, hang gliding. He goes, I don't want, I don't want this to like flash like it did in the seventies and then go away, you know? And anyway, so let me get back to another one. This is cool. This note is from Jenny Han, the girl that gave Jake the champagne. In the, I think in the movie, she said, this movie was very moving and real. Thanks for bringing back my roots. Jenny Han is like one of the OG first women pro riders. And you got clips of her in there at the, at some of the mm -hmm. early U S open. So hats off to you, Jenny, you were, you were definitely a pioneer inspired a lot of people. Um, this one here is, uh, was there anyone that Jake wanted to be in the movie that was not included? I was like, Hmm, you, you guys have anything about that? Was there anybody? Do you remember, that... do you remember Ben? From the list, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's it's just hard because, yeah. as you said, it's like some of these scenes could be entire movies. So yeah. it's really hard to leave things on the floor, and it's really also once in a while you start to get into a side story, whether it be Craig's story or something else. You know, you can never do it justice inside of Jake's film, and right. you you can't leave Jake's story for too long. It always has to connect back into. What, how it impacted the sport and, and Jake's journey. So that's something we always had to be mindful of. And there's just gold on the floor. We were talking to Palmer for hours and it was the craziest interview. And I was what like, let's just let it run. I know we're going to use like three lines in the whole movie, but this is just so fascinating. I remember laying in my backyard in the hammock working the interview with Fern because again, it was COVID and we did a bunch of remote stuff. But um, make it Palmer. There's so much of that. <laughs> story is insane. So, so you know pe people were very generous with their time and a lot of great things hit the floor that's probably one of the harder things about filmmaking is just when it's such a good story you can't yeah. gotta make tough choices well in 90 minutes too for you guys to cover everything it was, it was just incredible actually here's a nice note this is from a guy named jeff shore who was a he repped a bunch of brands and competed against me as a rep in new england but anyway he said uh, he's like, really enjoyed this. Jake not only grew Burton, but he also grew snowboarding as a whole, which allowed counts, countless people like me to make a living at something we loved and gain many friends and good times. Even though I was with a company competing with Burton, we all had so much respect for Jake. And he was always, spelled in caps, kind to us when we crossed paths. Thanks. Uh, grateful to Jake. So Jeff Shore, Thanks for that note. And that is very true. And um, then we have a note here. This is pretty interesting. This guy, Paul Graves, this guy is one of the original, original people in the sport of snowboarding. He lives down in Woodstock. He, his note says, someday I hope to share my stories 
about helping Jake in his earliest days to gifting him the national championships, which became the U.S. Open game changers. So Paul Graves, he ran an event at Suicide Six, which you guys showed in the film. And that was the national championships that then eventually turned into the U.S. Open of snowboarding. So Paul Graves, he has some other interesting things where he, I think, was the first person to uh, be in, a, in an ad on TV for like Labatt, Labatt beer and he's snowboarding. And it's like, whoa, that's pretty freaking cool to, <laughs> to see that. So that's cool that Paul listened in and chimed in on that. Um, there's a couple of other people I just wanted to name drop. Um, and Proxy, you can be in this too. Like some of the most influential people that like really weren't in the film, but Dennis Jensen, early marketing director was really influential and David Schreiber who ended up going on and working for Nike, like huge influence on Burton marketing. And then John Gurnt, who you guys have in the film, which I'm so glad, like in terms of product, you guys having John Gurnt in the film, that was really important to see. And that, that was awesome that he's part of the film. And then like on the sales side, John, John Yusko and Laurent Verneau, two guys that, and John Damiano also, those dudes help move the needle with, with on the sales side to really get that product in the market. And also, and then, also, and Smitty, Smitty. Smitty. Dave Smith's the one who, I think he's the one who talked Jake into hiring sales reps, which True. That's, that was it. And that's what got me in this whole thing. So, And Schmidt actually is on the Red Bench, Red Bench series uh, board of directors that helped br bring this event to into being. So Dave Schmidt, He's originally hired me away from marketing to work in sales. So I don't know, Schmitty, thank you, I think, right? Anyway, uh, all right, here's one other question. How did HBO become involved? Did they commit to showing it from the beginning? Sorry if you mentioned this earlier. I've been listening, but pulled away a few times. So you guys did say that, but I mean, was Red Bull, did you guys have it together as a Red Bull thing? And then HBO said would do it? Or how did that, what was the sequence on that? Yeah, I mean, the sequence was getting Jake uh, on board and committed to the project and making sure that was going to work, then selecting a creative team that um, could do the job. And then it was about like putting it together. We were, there's a lot of ways it could have been financed, but um, we happened to be at Sundance Film Festival um, yeah. meeting with the head of HBO Sports at the time uh, about another project, the first one that Fern and I worked on together, any one of us. And it's a very powerful film also on HBO, um, worth worth checking out. And it deals with spinal cord injury. And it's the kind of thing that's, you got to kind of see some of it to understand. It's a tough thing just to pitch in a room. So yeah. he added some time. He came by our little condo. We showed him some tape. He was like, I love this. Let's definitely talk about this. I want to get involved. So this is his first film with Fern. And, uh, said, you know, I have something else I really want to pass by you that I think could be really cool. And so he listened to the How I Built This interview, uh, mm -hmm. sent him some materials, and he said, I'm in. Like, I'm totally in. I see what you guys are doing with filmmaking. This is cool. a great story. I want to be involved. And uh, and just kind of breaking the mold from the 24-7 and sticking ball sports that HBO has really pioneered a lot of the sports formats over the decades, all the boxing stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. they've done the best of the best, but... You know, they've started to put some energy into things that are on the, the fringe of, of like counterculture and subcultures of sport that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. And hats off to that team. They've got an amazing creative team. And it's not like we're trying to impress them. When they bring notes, they're meaningful uh, feedback and they yeah. generally make the film better. So um, right. amazing. Let's throw, partner. This, let's throw this one in here. This is so crazy. This We got this note from Paul Johnston, great interview, PJ Stratton. And for people who don't know who that dude is, you he's in the film, but he's the one who said, hey man, we're gonna give you a shot. We're gonna let snowboarding on this major mountain. It was the first major mountain that believed in snowboarding. And that's that dude, Paul Johnston. And he just listened to this. He's in the film and Paul, like you helped make the sport fly. So thank you. We're going to be back down at Stratton <laughs> next yeah. weekend to terrorize <laughs> that mountain one more time. Uh, here's another one. Mark Angelillo. This guy is another like just super cool dude on the East Coast. His passion, love, 
and a visionary. Such an amazing journey through life. I'll never forget. Unreal. Thank you so much for all of your time and contribution on this historic movie. Right on, my friends. Right on, Jake and all of you. That's a nice note from Mark. Thank you, Mark. Next one is an anonymous one. It says, really appreciate this, boys. Thanks so much. I remember watching this the first time with my fiance, just an average skier. And after watching, she was just like, holy shit, now I understand this love you have for snowboarding and why it's such a passion. It's a culture. It's a way of life. And there are others just like you. And, and I was just like, yep, see, it's a way of life. And Jake is the godfather. Thanks again. P.S. I run the at right on Jake Instagram account. That's cool. Nice one, brother. Um, that was a cool note. And here's another one from Brandon Halberstadt. This dude worked for me, and this dude is a gnarly snowboarder. He's working for Oakley now. So Brandon's saying, there are so many Jake-isms that still exist within the brand, from outerwear to hard goods that were Jake's quirky specialty things that were true to his designs. Do you guys pick up on any, or have you, do you have a favorite Jake-ism that you picked up on or discovered during the movie that you love? And that's from Brandon Halberstadt. That's a good question. Cox, yeah, you I mean, gotta have them. Like, you know, I have a, a zipper or whatever. He's always like yeah. geeking out a product, you know. Dude, I have one I wish I had that I was with him testing on, and that was at um, Big Bear last Saturday when it was raining in the parking lot, and Jake had the little mat, you know, that we put in our bags and stuff, the changing mat for the parking yeah. lot. And of course, I didn't have it, and I was trying to, you know, do a pirouette to put my socks on and pants <laughs> and whatever. That was one where Jake's like tested all this different fabric and whatnot, and of course, I didn't have it. But Jake isms. I mean, the big one is don't fuck it up. I mean, that's the one. yeah. That, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. 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 Right? I mean, the, other than the don't fuck it up, uh, <laughs> you know how he's huge on those note cards. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. The first meeting, I was like, I just scribble almost self consciously. And he's like, I don't trust anyone who doesn't write things down. Whoa. Yeah. And I've used that multiple times. I'm like, you know, a wise man once told me because uh, he really believed in that part of the process. And it's funny, I accidentally I got a little tipsy and left my phone at his house after one of the fall bashes. And he wrote, he had it on the counter. I couldn't find it anywhere. And it was with one of the note cards. It was like, don't ever. Fucking leave your phone in my house again, or something like that, written on one of them. <laughs> no, yeah, right. hustle, hustle, you know, here, oh. hustle. Right there, we go. I, so here's the my, thing, guys. It's eight thirty. I could talk to you guys till probably two thirty in the morning, right? So we do have to wind this up. And I just want to say, like, thank you guys so much for putting together something like to me like this is this is 30 years of 33 years of my life you guys i couldn't imagine anyone telling this story any better than the way you did it if you guys have anything you want to say in closing or anything like each one of you guys just like wrap it up and then you know we'll probably come one more and then flip back to abby and anyone who's listening get some money flowing in the door here to abby <laughs> give her 10 bucks or more for the Red Veg series. So anyway, let me throw it to you guys. And if you got any closing statements here, Coxie, what do you got, brother? You know what? I, I think the community, we, we use that word Lucy of snowboarding, but it's real and it's global. And the people that we've all met and done business with, and some have worked at Burton, some not, have gone on and do beautiful, amazing things with their family, their business, and, and are still still shredding i think it's amazing and that's all jake man 100 percent mm -hmm. true burn you got any closing statements on this yeah I, I you know this is in my world snowboarding um so for me it was it was uh just this sense of um pretty just of discovery you know and and, and this i had this in in, in immense curiosity for the sport and the culture and everybody, everybody involved in it. And, you know, I approached it like, like I was like, like an alien who was just dropped it into this w world, you know, like, what is all this? Right. So for me, everything was new. Everything was interesting, you, you know, and, um, and, uh, and that was just my approach. Right. And I think, um, you know, snowboarders and snowboarding, the communities is, is I've, I've never experienced anything like it. You know, it is a family. 
like this family that gets bigger and bigger and, and bigger. So it's like this global family, but then, but then there's like the Burton, the carpenters, right. You, you know, mm -hmm. and, and their circle of influence. And it's just such, such an amazing thing. Thank you so much, dude. How about you, Ben? Just, uh, how welcoming and the, the love of, of being brought into the Carpenter family and people like uh, Coxie and Abby and the whole extended crew I always think of as family. So it was an honor and privilege for me to work on this film. I would do it for free, uh, but I'm glad I got paid for it because it helps put food on the table. But I mean, it's really amazing working with Fern. He doesn't just cut a film. It's not a job. He lives it. He thinks about it. He goes so deep. He has such a understanding of emotion and i just love making film with him and i would say to jake it's you don't ever have to snowboard a day in your life to take something from this film and we're not all going to be captains of industry and when you're gone it doesn't really matter it's the impact you leave on other people it's how you touch their lives it's how you choose to spend your time and i think we can all learn a lot from jake and 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 this film will be a good reminder of that for lots of people for years to come Oh, that's beautiful. I love it. Abby, you know, like I said, we could keep going until 2.30 in the morning, but I know we got to shut this down. So are you good? Are we, uh, yeah, there's a couple. Uh, there's three more Oh, really just comments. Um, if okay. you want to go through those, I think we have yeah. time for three more, but we'll we'll leave it at that. Well, cool. Yeah, no, because th that's nice that people, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah, no, this is incredible. All right, so here's one that says, Jeff Shore says, has Fern, does Fern snowboard now? <laughs> he has. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> now. I'm, wor yeah, I'm working on it, yeah. yeah. All right, very working cool. You know what? I love George, that. George, George told me to say yes. Well, you know what the thing yeah. is? Jake wasn't about, like, how good you were. It's like, were yeah. you actually just going to do it? Like, that's important, you know? So, mm -hmm. anyway, that's cool that you got he got you on snow, too. Here's one from Leslie Gender, and it says, knowing Jake was, uh, was a really special thing. Y'all did an incredible job of sharing that special thing with the world. Just wanted to say thanks. Thank you, Leslie. That's nice. And then this one, oh, my God, this is crazy. <laughs> this is from Bill Bennion. It says, and Bill Bennion, let me tell you who this guy is. He was the Burton coach when when the, when snowboarding was a team. We had a Burton team. We used to travel around the world. Bill would set gates and make Craig Kelly and Brushy run slalom gates. Those dudes even wore hard boots a few times. So insane. This dude was a coach. And then Burton like said, no. Jake said, Snowboarding's not a team sport. It's an individual sport. We're not doing this alpine thing. We had alpine riders chasing stuff, but Bill was the last of the, the quote unquote coaches. So he says, copes me. He says, so good to see you, this and you. My time with you, it was brief, but like so many things, the education was the best and truly a life changer. And that's Bill Bennion right there, the, the last coach of uh, professional snowboarding for Burton. And uh, he was a good dude, man. That's super cool that he just dialed in on that. That's funny. He's he's part of the history of Burton for sure. Anyway, uh, I'm drained. I'm like, I'm like, I was so <laughs> looking forward to this thing, man. And you guys are just like, oh. So I'm fired up. I'm energized. Uh, you guys got me fired up. Go, go, go. So rad, dude. Go. It was like this movie, like, I think about this like in 10 or 15 years, kids are going to watch this and it's like, oh, that's what snowboarding was like way back then, you know? And it's, this is like a historical document of this arc of the sport. And it's, and it's just, like I said, it's true. It's everything was true there. And you guys, heart and soul, man, you put a lot into that and you really, really nailed it. And I think everybody in the snowboard community can watch that film and take a lot of pride in it and go, I'm part of that community. You know, that's it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Perfect, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, all of you, Chris, Fern, Ben, Brian. It really, it amazes me still after uh, this is my fourth year doing this, uh, that there's so much generosity out there from folks like you willing to volunteer their time for these events. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight and for sharing so much insight into the making of this film. It was fascinating. Um, and thank you to the audience. Without you, we'd have 
no reason to host these events. And I'm grateful that you continue to keep watching because this series is truly my favorite part of my work at the museum. Um, like I said, this is the last one of this season, but if you have ideas um, of topics you'd like to see next season, feel free to let us know. We'll start working on that this summer. Um, and next week we have what has become our annual vintage online auction launching. Uh, that'll be next Friday. So keep an eye on your inbox if you're subscribed to our newsletter uh, with that link. We'll have vintage maps, gear, artwork, various equipment up for bid. Um, and I'll echo Chris, donate. Don't forget to donate. Um, yes. And you could uh, win a chance to pair, win, win a pair of darn tough snow socks. What a steal. And <laughs> tomorrow is St. Patty's Day. Slank. Have a little Guinness. Have a car bomb. Have a little Jameson's. Yeah, baby. Yeah. It's also <laughs> my birthday weekend. So your gift to me would be to donate to the museum. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the good work, Abby. <laughs> thanks, for, Thank you. thanks for keeping the flame on there. And good old stuff. All right. I think it's time.